deadly airport attack, chaos in Yemen as video captures hundreds running for cover after an explosion and gunfire at the airport, moments after the arrival of a plane carrying the country's newly formed cabinet. More than 20 killed. We'll have the latest on the attack. Missing the target. More questions tonight as Operation Warp Speed officials acknowledge the U.S. is falling short of the goal of getting 20 million COVID vaccine doses out before the end of the year. In Florida, seniors are lining up for hours to get their shots as President Trump casts blame on states working to get the vaccine out to Americans. Tracking the spread. The country records its deadliest 24 hours of the pandemic as that highly contagious variant first found in the UK is confirmed in Colorado and now in California. And as hospitalizations reach alarming highs, the military is stepping in to support some California hospitals. Warning signs. New developments in the investigation into the Christmas Day bombing in Nashville. ABC News has learned that police were warned about the suspect a year ago. His girlfriend telling police he was building bombs in an RV. What authorities are saying tonight on whether the suspect should have been on their radar. And new year, new celebration. The countdown to 2021 can't come soon enough, but this year, the famous Times Square ball drop will look a little different. We're behind the scenes with the New Year's Eve virtual party planners working to help the country close the door on a tumultuous 2020. It's a sign of hope, it's a sign of happiness, it's a sign of generosity, and that's what it's all about. Good evening, I'm Janae Norman in for Lindsay Davis. Thank you for streaming with us tonight. As we approach the new year, we end 2020 with another grim milestone in the pandemic. The U.S. recording its deadliest day so far Tuesday. More than 3,700 U.S. lives lost to COVID-19 in just 24 hours. Now at least 341,000 American lives lost in the pandemic. And the latest CDC forecast projects we could reach as many as 424,000 deaths by January 23rd. Those sobering numbers come as that highly contagious COVID-19 variant has been confirmed here in the U.S. in Colorado and now the latest case tonight in California as well. And finger pointing is growing over the slow rollout of the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines across the U.S. Just 2.6 million vaccine shots in arms recorded by the federal government, far short of the goal of 20 million vaccinations by the end of the year. The images in Fort Myers, Florida, tell the story. Hundreds of people, many of them high-risk seniors, camping out overnight to get their shots. Officials with Operation Warp Speed admitted today that vaccinations are not going as fast as they had hoped as President Trump shifts the blame to the states. ABC's Stephanie Ramos starts us off tonight. Tonight, officials acknowledging what America is experiencing. The coronavirus vaccine rollout has been slower than promised. Just look at these images. Hundreds of people waiting in line overnight in Florida to get their first shots. 90-year-old Abdullah Benkatar in line for nearly 24 hours. It's very important for me for my health and, and to be able to do things I like to do and get back to normal. So far, the federal government distributing more than 14 million doses nationwide, but only about two and a half million shots have been reported, far short of the 20 million vaccinations promised by the new year. Tonight, ABC News learning there are also issues at the state and local level, including the Pfizer vaccine's complex storage requirements, uncertainty over the supply of doses, and the strain on local health agencies in this surging pandemic. Federal officials today saying they need to do a better job, but blaming the sluggish rollout in part on this. There's two holidays. There's been three major snowstorms. Every day, everybody gets better. Uh, and I believe that uh, uptake will increase. President Trump taking to Twitter, putting the blame on the states, urging them to, quote, get moving. In Maryland, more than 80 percent of the 191,000 doses received have yet to be administered. It's not just sticking needles in arms. There's a lot of uh, moving parts, and I think uh, nobody is quite uh, performing uh, at the top capacity, and we've all got to work together to ramp it up. Overseas today, the UK authorizing the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine, which is cheaper and easier to store than Pfizer's. This is a massive thing for the world. The UK also facing challenges with its vaccine rollout, now changing its policy, giving the first dose of the vaccine to as many people as possible instead of reserving doses for the second shot. 
Hi. And Stephanie Ramos joins me now. Stephanie, the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines right now are the only ones available in the U.S., but we may have more on the horizon in the new year. Absolutely, Janae. Officials say Johnson & Johnson could apply for emergency authorization by the end of January with possible authorization in early February. And AstraZeneca could be available here in the U.S. if authorized by April. But the CDC, they are saying they expect vaccinations to increase fast by next week. And that is some good news. And that Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine could be particularly important outside of the U.S. Absolutely. The Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine will be huge for developing countries. Wealthier countries have already bought up so much of the supply of the Pfizer and Moderna vaccine and Oxford AstraZeneca. They are committing to as many as a billion doses for low to middle income countries, which is, is huge for them and something that they haven't seen just yet. Wow. And that could be some very good news. Stephanie Ramos, thank you so much. And now to that highly contagious COVID-19 variant found today in California after a case was already reported in Colorado. The virus is spreading out of control across the country with Los Angeles County alone crossing the grim milestone of 10,000 deaths. This as hospitalizations reach peak capacity. ABC's Kaylee Hartung reports tonight from L.A. Tonight, that new, more contagious variant from the UK now detected in the Golden State. An hour or so ago, we were informed that this new variant, this new strain, has been identified here in the state of California. In Colorado, officials revealing more details about the country's first confirmed case. He's currently recovering in isolation, mild symptoms. And now a possible second one there, though officials have not yet confirmed. Both are members of Colorado's National Guard, deployed last week to a small rural town to help the Good Samaritan Society nursing home amid a COVID outbreak. All 26 residents and a majority of the staff testing positive. Officials now investigating how the National Guard members were infected. Neither has a recent history of international travel. We do not have evidence that the variant virus is circulating in that facility, um, but testing is ongoing. Colorado officials using genetic sequencing to discover the variant, but this type of screening is not as widespread in the U.S. This as the U.S. hits yet another grim milestone. Tuesday, the deadliest day of the pandemic, as a record more than 124,000 people fight the virus in the hospital. From Boston to New York, churches ringing their bells to honor those American lives lost. Like Louisiana Congressman-elect Luke Litlow, dying from COVID at just 41 years old, a married father of two. And in California, the surge continues to rage. After the Christmas holiday season, I, I'm scared to death, honestly. But I just look back on New York City and Italy, and that's what, I, that's what we feel like right now. 75 U.S. military personnel being fitted for their PPE as they deploy to four Southern California hospitals in dire need. Across the country, North Carolina in a staffing crisis, too. We are preparing for what would equivalent be of a hurricane or a tsunami. And in Chicago, Deborah Simintel is struggling to process her daughter Sarah's death. The normally healthy 18-year-old tested positive with mild COVID symptoms the weekend before Christmas. She died one week later. No parent should ever have to watch their child go through that. Nobody. And Kaylee Hartung joined us from a hospital in Los Angeles. Kaylee, we knew it was only a matter of time before we saw new cases of this new variant here in the U.S. What can you tell us about that patient in California? Gail, Janae, we're just learning that the patient is a 30-year-old man in San Diego and he has no history of travel. Someone else in his household is symptomatic and they're being tested. Uh, now, tonight, across the country, labs are screening for this new variant. But the CDC reminds us that while it is thought to be more contagious, it has not been found to be more deadly. So they do believe it will respond to vaccines. Janae. All right, Kaylee, thank you so much from Hard Hit L.A. County there. For more now on the health care crisis in Los Angeles, we're joined tonight by Dr. Christina Galley, the director of the L.A. County Department of Health Services. L.A. is the largest county in the country and now accounts for more than half of the COVID deaths in the state of California. Dr. Galley, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Governor Newsom announced today that the highly contagious coronavirus variant first detected in the U.K. has now been found in Southern California. How concerned are you and does this change any of your response planning? 
This is certainly concerning, though I do believe it was really only a matter of time before the variant was found in Southern California. Uh, you know, it's a variant that is of concern because it spreads so easily and because it leads to such high transmission. So because of that, it's not surprising that it was found here. But there's nothing new that people need to do other than just continue to follow those same practices we've put in place that people have been expected to follow the whole time. It's just all the more reason to do so now, which is that importance of staying home, wearing the mask, and avoiding the intermingling with those outside of your household. And even before the aftermath of all of the holiday travel right now, we are seeing those overrun hospitals in L.A. that are out of ICU beds, facing oxygen shortages, and setting up treatment areas in tents, conference rooms, even in gift shops. How is this impacting the care that patients are getting, and what kind of rationing could we see potentially in the coming days and weeks? It's really, it's a tragic and heartbreaking situation on so many levels in so many facilities, and it's affecting hospitals across the board. There are 70 hospitals in Los Angeles County's, County with emergency departments, and virtually all of them are struggling with astronomically high numbers of cases of patients with COVID, and that reduces their ability to care for other patients with other conditions. As has been reported in the news, ambulances are stacking up outside of emergency departments, having long delays in offloading patients. There's been some bad outcomes with patients who can't be unloaded from ambulances in a timely manner. There's not an ability to move patients out of the emergency department upstairs into an ICU or a regular bed because there's just not sufficient numbers of those beds to have because of the overall shortage of staff. And that puts everybody's life at risk. And with the shortages of staff in those hospitals struggling, I know back back in April, we saw the USNS Mercy there outside of California for about six weeks helping um, with the pandemic at that time. Now with the shortages, the L.A. County Supervisor is asking for more health care workers and for that U.S. Navy ship to return. Do you also think that that's necessary at this point? We'll take uh, additional healthcare staff and trained providers and nurses and respiratory therapists from whatever source they can come from. Uh, if that's through uh, the help of the federal government, through disaster medical assistance teams or DOD teams, including the U.S. Mercy, uh, through registry and contract staff, whatever is the source of staff, uh, we don't have a preference as to one type or another. What we do need is help. And we've asked the state as well as the federal government to provide assistance with staffing our hospitals so that they can continue to doing that hard work of providing patient care in the midst of this surge. Let's talk real quick about the vaccine rollout because that is something that you are facing right now as you're also dealing with these incredible surge of cases and hospitals and staff overwhelmed. How do you think the vaccine rollout is going at this point? We know that it's been slower than planned, but do you feel like enough advanced planning was, was done and do you feel that you're getting enough help from the federal government? The vaccine administration plan is led by our sister department, the Department of Public Health, but what I've seen in the hospitals, which is one of the two populations prioritized for distribution or first on, is that the distribution's gone very well. Within our hospital systems, our four directly operated hospitals, we've provided over 10,000 doses of vaccine to our frontline healthcare workers, and other hospitals across the region are also doing very well with the rollout. Uh, in parallel to that, with the Banderna vaccine, there's a prioritization right now going on for individuals who live and work in skilled nursing facilities and congregate care facilities. And the thing that we're worried about right now is just the, the consistent manner in which the supply of vaccine, particularly for the healthcare workers, it's the Pfizer vaccine, those numbers aren't coming in as had been initially anticipated. And that, again, puts our healthcare workers at risk. We need to have sufficient doses of those vaccines so that all of the frontline healthcare workers who put their lives at risk, who are interacting with patients on a daily basis, can have the vaccine if they're willing to receive it. And we're just not at that point yet. And amidst the surge in cases that we're seeing really across the country, we're also hearing about younger people, those in their 30s and 40s, of course, some in their 50s, getting very sick, even dying from COVID. Some countries are vaccinating this population before some of the elderly. What are your thoughts on that and how to best protect everyone? It's a complicated topic. Certainly most of the deaths that we've seen from COVID are in the individuals who are over age 65. Uh, but 
to your point, absolutely. This is a disease and a virus that can infect anyone and it can kill anyone. And it doesn't matter necessarily how old you are. It doesn't matter if you have underlying health conditions. We've seen perfectly healthy individuals who had no medical problems come into the hospital and pass away, tragically pass away at very young ages, in their 30s and their 40s, as you said. Right now, the advice from the CDC, which the state of California and Los Angeles County is following, is that the prioritization for that vaccine among patient populations Populations should still be given prioritization to those over 65 and over age 75 rather than to the younger populations. And, and speaking of prioritizing vaccinations, the LA Unified School District, the second largest in the country, has been closed for in-person classes since March. But Governor Newsom announced today that he wants to reopen schools in February. That's not that long away. Is your department working on this as well? And do you think that teachers should be among some of the first to get vaccinated? Yes, teachers are among one of the priority groups in the rollout for the vaccination, and for good reason. They're frontline uh, essential workers, just the same as so many other essential workers across the county. Very excited about the governor's plan to push to reopen schools. That's what's best for education, especially some of the lower income and more vulnerable populations that have really struggled with distance learning. They're not thriving in that environment, and for the sake of their long-term development and education, I think it's imperative that we work to get kids back in school. It needs to be set, done safely. Safely, though, and I know that there's a variety of steps uh, that were announced by the state to help protect teachers, support teachers, provide testing uh, to the staff and teachers, as well as the kids, as well as to provide, to your point, vaccinations, as well as PPE to make sure everyone can stay safe in doing so. Dr. Galley, thank you so much for your work on the front lines and good luck to you. Thanks very much. Take care. Now to new developments in the Nashville Christmas Day bombing and the possible warning signs that may have been missed. ABC News learning the suspect's former girlfriend alerted authorities a year ago that he was making explosives. And now we're hearing the 911 calls made before and after that powerful explosion. Here's ABC's Trevor Alt. Tonight, potentially missed warning signs. More than a year before the Christmas Day bombing that shook downtown Nashville. Police said this week that alleged bomber Anthony Warner was not on their radar. But documents obtained by ABC News show police were warned about him. In August 2019, Warner's then-girlfriend told officers Warner was building bombs in the RV trailer at his residence. And a lawyer for the girlfriend told police Warner is capable of making a bomb. The police report says officers tried checking on Warner at his home, but no one came to the door. They wrote the RV was outside with several security cameras and wires attached to an alarm sign on the front door. Nashville's police chief saying today his officers saw no evidence of a crime. The officers didn't take it lightly. They didn't have anything else to go on. Police did relay the information to the FBI, who at the time said they had no records on Warner. This is 911 calls a release from residents calling in before the explosion. We have a recording out here saying there's a limited time to evacuate this area. Where's your car? And after. There was just a massive explosion downtown with a huge fireball. The detonation damaging more than 40 buildings downtown. Before the bombing, Anthony Warner had studied a number of conspiracy theories and investigators had said paranoia over 5G technology may be a reason this bombing happened in front of an AT&T building, though investigators have still not yet pinned down Anthony Warner's exact motive. The Nashville police chief did further explain today that because there was no evidence of a crime when they went to Warner's home back in 2019 at the advice of his former girlfriend, they had no reason to further search his property. They were at the end of the road and the chief said there were no other reports regarding Warner until this Christmas Day bombing. Janae. All right, thanks to Trevor on that story. Well, in the last hour, reports of airstrikes hitting the airport in Yemen's capital. This coming after an earlier blast left multiple people dead and dozens more injured at a separate airport in the Middle Eastern country. In this video here, you can see people running for safety as an explosion makes the ground shake. And that cloud of smoke that you saw appearing, ABC's James Longman has this report. <laughs> Hundreds of supporters had lined up on the tarmac to celebrate the arrival of Yemen's newly formed unity government from Saudi Arabia, the massive crowd surrounding the plane to greet the new cabinet. They were met instead by terror. Watch as the crowd runs from the explosion, moments after the officials start to disembark. The fireball on the tarmac rises into the air. People are unsure which way to go. The officials coming off the plane taken to safety. 
in all at least 22 dead, more than 50 wounded. Yemen blamed Iranian-backed Houthi rebels for the attack, with whom the country has been locked in a bloody civil war for years. It escalated when a Saudi-led coalition launched a military operation in 2015, which has since left the world's poorest country with over 100,000 dead and a famine which the UN calls the worst humanitarian crisis on earth. This new unity government has been formed just a month before Joe Biden takes office himself. He's been critical of Saudi Arabia's destabilizing role in the region and its proxy wars with Iran. This will be one of the biggest foreign policy challenges he'll face as president. Janae? James Longman in London for us. James, thank you. And when we come back, news in Breonna Taylor's case. A woman killed as police executed a no-knock warrant at her apartment. Tonight, news on the fate of two officers involved. Plus, twin storms slamming the U.S. just in time for New Year's. Ginger Z is standing by with our New Year's Eve forecast. And that famous ball is ready to drop in Times Square, but celebrations will look, as you can imagine, a little bit different this year. What you can expect coming up after the break. Admit it, these days, what you need to know seems to change, well, like every day. So what is it that you really need to know, want to know, to help you not just get through your day, but make the most of it? Feel smarter, feel better, feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America in the afternoon? GMA3, what you need to know. It's all about you. Lunchtime at 1 Eastern, 12 Central and Pacific on ABC. This is going to be so good. The reality is our country can collapse from within. You see the white power movement on the march. Klansmen and neo-Nazis, skinheads, it's meant to incite war. From the KKK to Oklahoma City to Charlottesville, the new documentary event special. We just need to start talking about race. Homegrown hate, the war among us. This is a real wake-up call. Streaming now on ABC News Live. What you're seeing right now, this is part of the eye wall. This procession of migrants goes back two miles. There is going to be catastrophic damage. This fire has made a run. You can see those flames shooting up into the sky. We are on the jam-packed red carpet. Let's do it right, guys. So this is the fourth week end of protest. <laughs> Watch NBC News on location for Facebook Watch. Your mom said, comb your hair. Your dad told you, smart not. Your dog is judging you right now. And your best friend just called you crazy. We all need someone who'll pull no punches and give it to us straight. Now imagine getting your news like that. No bull, no spin, just give it to me straight. Straightforward news straight to the heart of the story. ABC News, straightforward. What's the most innovative daily news podcast out there to listen to every day? Well, the Edward R. Murrow Awards say it's Start Here, the daily news podcast from ABC News. Even the New York Times calls us a top news podcast worth listening to. So if you like getting behind the biggest news stories of the day, inside all the details, the backstory, and what will happen next, then listen to Start Here, the daily news podcast from ABC News. It's like no other news podcast out there. Even the critics agree. Listen free on Apple Podcasts. Welcome back. We want to get to those two New Year's storms moving across the U.S. with heavy snow, ice, and rain. An ice storm downing trees on top of cars, as you can see there in Plattsburgh, Missouri, and triggering whiteout conditions in Des Moines, Iowa. Imagine trying to drive in that. ABC's chief meteorologist, Ginger Zeese, timing it all out. Hey, Ginger. Janae, we already saw what Storm 1 did and more than a half foot of snow through the day today in parts of Michigan. Big Rapids picked it up. Muskegon, too. A lot of folks back home talking about that. But let's go ahead to the map because 2020 ending, 2021 starting, and you got a lot of alerts to look at. Flash flood watches from the Ozarks down to just west of Houston, including Tyler. San Angelo up to Kansas City. You're on the cold side, so winter storm watches, advisories, and warnings. Let's tell you how, when it all happens and really show you who's going to get what when. So along the Gulf Coast, Tomorrow, to end 2020, you have a tornado threat. Lake Charles, 
That is the town that got hit by a hurricane twice, if you'll remember. They will end with a tornado threat tomorrow. Beaumont, Port Arthur, all the way over to Mobile and including parts of um, Alabama by the time we reach 2021. But look at the icy side, Oklahoma City up through Kansas City. So that's late night as that pink area, that's the wintry mix, moves to the north. I want you to follow that and see what it does through Quincy, Illinois, up to Cedar Rapids. The same spots that just got hit with that first storm are going to get snow or an icy mix again. Again, but now it extends all the way with a shield of potential ice to Scranton, Pennsylvania. Thunderstorms along the Gulf. Janae. Our thanks to Ginger. It is one of the most exciting moments of the year. The countdown to midnight as we watch the Times Square ball drop on New Year's Eve to ring in a new year. Have you ever looked forward to a new year as much as you do right now? Tonight, I am happy to inform all of you that 2020 will not be taking the ball drop from us, but it will look a tad bit different. In a year that's been anything but normal, this is a familiar sight. Those iconic Waterford crystal panels placed into the New Year's Eve ball high above Times Square during preparations, like all the years before this one. But this isn't an ordinary year. This is 2020. And while we're used to hearing brave revelers brace themselves for that marathon to midnight. I have a diaper, <laughs> so I'm ready. We didn't know we had to stand for this long. It's very thrilling and exciting, but it's also very cold <laughs> and there are no toilets. COVID had other plans for ringing in the new year. We're working very closely with the New York City Police Department to create a safe environment for us to film the event and keep others away. And said the streets will be empty, all in an effort to stem the spread of the coronavirus. But one tradition will remain the same. That 12,000 pound ball of nearly 2,700 LED lit crystal panels will descend upon a hushed Times Square to usher in 2021. The Times Square Alliance, host of Times Square's New Year's Eve celebrations, holding a virtual event this year. Waterford Crystal Artisan and spokesperson Tom Brennan says the in-person festivities in the square are reserved for only a special few, frontline heroes and their families, around 100 people in total. We are honoring basically the heroes of 2020, all of those frontline workers, all of those absolute superstars, those superheroes that took care of all of us and our loved ones. They'll be honored as special guests and swooned by disco legend Gloria Gaynor, who will perform her classic hit. a fitting anthem for those who've made it through this taxing year and helped so many of us make it through also. Two, one, happy new year! This year posed unique challenges to the ball's production process because the team couldn't meet in person. It's very laborious. It's basically a behemoth of moving crystal across the world. Think about that, right? I don't know, it has to be beautifully packaged and it has to be taken care of and all the samples. We did have to come together to basically look at the finished product, and that took place sometime around early to mid-December. We all had to basically do this over the phone and on Zoom calls and WebEx and you name it. So it has been extremely challenging, but, you know, the greater good always prevails. But despite all the hurdles, Tom says it was especially important for the show to still go on in spite of the pandemic strain. The iconic Waterford Crystal Times Square Ball, you know, stands as an enduring tradition. It's a sign of hope. It's a sign of happiness. It's a sign of generosity, and that's what it's all about. Let the countdown to 2021 begin. Well, still ahead, the latest as police search for the woman they say falsely accused a black teenager of stealing her phone. Plus, nearly one year ago, China revealed the coronavirus was spreading. So where are they now in the fight against COVID-19? And remembering a legend, the moment sports stopped and the powerful sports stars who took a stand. But first, celebrating the new year from space. Take a watch. We hope this inspires you to celebrate in your own way. Three, two, two one. Happy New Year! This is what being live is all about. This is ABC News Live, the 24-7 streaming news source, ABC News. Breaking news, live events as they happen, streaming live, non-stop, straight to you. Original, on the edge, breakthrough storytelling, 
from ABC News, National Geographic, ESPN, all designed differently for you to stream straight to any screen whenever you want, free. And imagine the most celebrated, epic live events and moments all playing out right before your eyes. See those flames behind me? And go deeper inside the groundbreaking exclusives from the campaign trail only ABC News gets. Watch ABC News Live right now and anytime. Streaming on Roku, Hulu, Facebook, and ABCNews.com. ABC News Live. Streaming everywhere right to you. ABC News Live. The Americans here on the ground and the Iraqis. 18,000 tons. Matatas. Ismail. David. David. Ground zero from Hurricane Michael. You can see just home after home. David, thanks for meeting us. This was your view. My favorite view. Thank you for Thank you. Yes, mornings may look different these days, but where you start your day, where you spend your mornings, where you get connected to everything that's happening. And face it, there's a whole lot happening in our world these days. Where you get all the breaking new information of the day to help you navigate through these times. That's why we're here. Good morning, sunshine. And making sure you start your day off with a smile and some sunshine. Good morning, America. Good morning, America. Good morning, America. Oh, how I love saying that. The world may feel out of your control, but your happiness doesn't have to be. Learn the secrets to happiness. Listen to the 10% Happier podcast, free on Apple Podcasts. ABC News, honored. Winner for the second straight year with the Edward R. Murrow Award for overall excellence in television. ABC News, America's number one news source. This is GMA3, what you need to know. GMA3. A third hour of Good Morning America in the afternoon. It's all about you. Lunchtime on ABC. Tomorrow marks the one year anniversary of the first public statement about a mysterious illness described by the Chinese government as a pneumonia of unknown origins. It's now known as COVID-19 and has killed 1.8 million people across the world. But China, where the virus was first detected, now seems to be containing it rather well, with the caveat that experts question the reliability of that country's data. So we take a closer look by the numbers. China has reported a total of 95,800 151 coronavirus cases in a country of 1.4 billion people. In stark contrast, more than 19 million Americans have caught the virus, about 200 times China's count. 4,781, that's China's reported COVID-19 death toll, a tiny fraction of the more than 341,000 coronavirus deaths in the U.S. Wuhan, the first major city to experience COVID-19 and lockdown, is now back to a fairly normal level life, as is most of China. China's economy has remained relatively stable, shrinking by 6.8% in the first quarter of 2020, then growing by 3.2% and another 4.9% in the following quarters, according to Chinese data that some question. And just today, Chinese drug maker Sinopharm announced its COVID vaccine is 79.3% effective, according to preliminary data from its final testing. So ahead tonight, the search continues for for the woman who falsely accused a black teenager of stealing her phone. Outrage growing around the incident. Hear from that young man's parents coming up. Plus, from losing a legend to pausing our favorite pastimes and taking a stand. We look back at the year in sports and the silver linings. We look at the moments and the people who inspired us and kept us going during this tough year. But first, a look at our top trending stories on abcnews.com. is our country can collapse from within. You see the white power movement on the march. You will not replace us! Klansmen and neo-Nazis, skinheads, it's meant to incite war. From the KKK to Oklahoma City to Charlottesville, the new documentary event special. We just need to start talking about race. Homegrown hate, the war among us. This is a real wake-up call. Streaming now on ABC News Live. Burning. Now 
When it matters most, the straightforward facts. ABC News is America's number one news. Number one in the morning. Number one in the evening with America's most watched newscast. Number one in late night versus the competition. The number one news magazine on Friday nights. Number one in politics across this historic election versus the competition. The number one daytime talk show. And number one in streaming news. ABC News is America's number one news. What's the most innovative daily news podcast out there to listen to every day? Well, the Edward R. Murrow Awards say it's Start Here, the daily news podcast from ABC News. Even the New York Times calls us a top news podcast worth listening to. So if you like getting behind the biggest news stories of the day, inside all the details, the backstory, and what will happen next, then listen to Start Here, the daily news podcast from ABC News. It's like no other news podcast out there. Even the critics agree. Listen free on Apple Podcasts. Yes, mornings may look different these days, but where you start your day, where you spend your mornings, where you get connected to everything that's happening. And face it, there's a whole lot happening in our world these days. Where you get all the breaking new information of the day to help you navigate through these times. That's why we're here. Good morning, sunshine. And making sure you start your day off with a smile and some sunshine. Good morning, America. Good morning, America. Good morning, America. Oh, how I love saying that. The most powerful stories of our time, anytime. Nightline. Friday nights, 9, 8 central. True crime, cinematic, real life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime, 2020. Friday nights, 9, 8 central on ABC. Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell says he doesn't support boosting stimulus checks to $2,000 for Americans struggling in this pandemic. McConnell says Democrats are putting pressure on him, even though President Trump called for the increase and tweeted for the Senate leader and Republicans to pass it. The Senate's not going to be bullied into rushing out more borrowed money into the hands of Democrat rich friends who don't need the help. McConnell filing new legislation binding the boosted direct payments to two unrelated matters. Democrats were calling poison pills. What we're seeing right now is Leader McConnell trying to kill the checks, the $2,000 checks. McConnell's bill ensures a vote on the stimulus checks would also mean a decision on a committee to investigate election fraud and repealing protections for social media companies. It's amazing to see the patience that some people have with other people suffering. Senator Bernie Sanders threatening a vote on the $2,000 checks, or he'll hold up another priority vote to override Trump's veto on the annual defense bill. We're in the most threatened situation we've ever been in. Resulta aprobado con 38. A landmark bill is passed in Argentina. Jubilant crowds in Buenos Aires as Argentina became the largest country in South America to legalize abortion. The historic 38 to 29 ruling, with one abstention, legalizes terminations in the first 14 weeks of pregnancy and overturns a century-old law in which women could be imprisoned for having an abortion. Argentina is a largely Catholic country and Pope Francis's homeland, and women's rights campaigners hope Wednesday's landmark decision will reverberate across the region that has some of the harshest abortion laws in the world. Two Louisville, Kentucky police officers are set to lose their jobs over the death of Breonna Taylor. Detectives Joshua Jaynes and Miles Cosgrove have received letters of termination. Although the shooting didn't result in criminal charges, two detectives are now facing termination from their jobs. One shot Taylor, the other prepared the search warrants that led to the incident. After all the protests over the failure to indict officers over Taylor's shooting, the possible termination of two detectives' jobs will be cheered by some, but attacked as too little too late by others. These dramatic pictures from a landslide in Norway, leaving at least a dozen people missing. The huge chunk of earth giving way north of Oslo, several homes collapsing into the crater. The debris so delicate, only helicopters are being used to search for survivors. Some 700 residents evacuated. That region had seen several days of rain. 
She had the kind of wholesome, all-American look and charm, and it helped turn her into a star in one of the biggest sitcoms of the 1960s. Today, we learn that Gilligan's Island star Dawn Wells has died. She was 82. Wells played Mary Ann, a country girl who got marooned on a three-hour tour. The original show ran for just three years in the 1960s, but it still airs around the world in dozens of languages. Prior to the show, Wells was Miss Nevada and competed in the Miss America contest. She died of coronavirus. <laughs> New York police are still trying to find the woman who falsely accused a black teenager of stealing her phone. Today, the attorney for the boy and his parents held a press conference where his mother shared the pain she felt when her young son told her that the woman probably felt threatened by him. No 14-year-old boy should be scared and threatened. That's right. That's right. <laughs> they shouldn't have to feel scared or feel like they're threatening anybody. Our Adrian Bankert has more on this investigation. The NYPD is trying to find this woman, seen confronting and physically trying to take a phone away from a 14-year-old boy, claiming he stole her property. Show me this is my phone. Show me, no. You don't have to explain no. nothing to her. Take the face off, that's mine. Literally, get it back. Are you kidding me? You feel like there's only one, one iPhone made in the world? Police say they now know who this woman is and that she's likely from out of state. Officers now trying to locate the woman who left before police arrived at the Arlo Hotel in downtown New York where the incident occurred. It all began when she allegedly began harassing jazz musician Keon Harold and his son, Keon Harold Jr., guests of the hotel. The teen and his parents appearing on GMA Tuesday. We hit the lobby and she was all on him, asking him for his phone immediately. I was confused because I've never seen that lady ever. I think she was scared. So that's why when she saw me, she just jumped on, my, jumped on me and attacked me. The video Harold shared of the scuffle seen over two million times. It shows the woman repeatedly demanding they give her the phone. Black people. No, I'm not letting him walk away with my phone. Get on no. Police say the woman attempted to take the 14-year-old's phone, grabbing his leg, and tried to tackle him. Get on no, please get my phone back. I can't. I cannot. Don't have my phone. Get your ass off. I mean, she basically tackled. She scratched me. I couldn't imagine what it would have been like if I wasn't there to, to be with him. I would ask her why would she do something like this to a kid who has never met you at all. The Manhattan District Attorney's Office says it is thoroughly investigating this incident. I'm angry, I'm hurt, but I do I want to I know why. We don't have any clue why this woman attacked our son, so why? Our thanks to Adrian Banker. So what do you do? Where do you go when you believe the place you live is systematically racist? Some hope for change, some long for justice. And as Steve Osinsami showed us earlier this year, some are packing their bags. For now, it's just a campground on red Georgia clay under the hot Georgia sun. We're able to address things like violence by living in tolerance and love and being example with one another. But for the black Americans who are moving here, this is a dream. And we just want to welcome you to Freedom, Georgia. Welcome to Freedom! <laughs> we improvise in freedom. <laughs> They're starting small, 19 families so far who've pooled their money to buy these 97 acres of land about two hours south of Atlanta, their freedom, Georgia. It's their escape from what they say is the everyday racism that feels a part of life in America. Man, please don't shoot me, man. Please, man. I just lost my mom, man. The final push, they tell us, came this summer. After seeing these images of black Americans being gunned down by white police officers and white neighbors. We came together and we said, you know what? We don't like being slaughtered in the streets. We don't like our children be at the, being at the mercy of some psychopath that wants to tackle us and, and arrest us and bang our heads. We don't want that. So how about we just come together and build our own? Renee Walters and Ashley Scott are the two women who started this all after seeing an ad for affordable land. Well, it was a post that went viral um, about buy a town for sale for the price of an a New York apartment. And so when I looked at it, I saw it had all these parcels and acres. This is by no means the first time where people who felt persecuted or unwanted have left a place 
to raise stakes somewhere new. Immigrants from Ireland, Italy, and Germany all moved to America to find better lives and created ethnic communities. It's why the conservative Dutch left the motherland in the mid-1800s and set up in Holland, Michigan. The tulip festivals and their windmills are important to the people here to this day. So we was on the road all day yesterday. But these are Americans who are already in the land of the free. The Browns are one of the thousands of black families thinking about building here. They drove down from Chicago on Labor Day weekend to investigate. I think that if we want to feel safe, secure, and be able to honor our culture, our heritage, and plan for our children, and not have to worry about what happens to them when they leave out the door, we have to, as you said, not necessarily segregate, but have our own. There are so many communities that have their own space, and it's not that we're anti-anything. It's we have to be pro-black love, you know? Kendra Field is a historian who underlines that black Americans have tried this before, and she says that racial violence is usually the reason why. Nicodemus, Kansas, Eatonville, Florida, Mound Bayou, Mississippi, all the results, she says, of the black bodies that hung from the trees of their time. There's a, a really rich and long history of African-American emigration, uh, both domestically and also abroad, for instance, back to African movement, um, and uh, almost always in response to, in relationship to the history of racial violence and economic exploitation in the U.S. What do you say to people who say, you know, well, that's kind of racist to want to, you know, um, segregate yourself in that way, and that if white Americans did this, um, we would be saying that this is racist? I would just echo that, you know, how we think of these things, freedom, racism, integration, <laughs> depends on one's circumstances and the moment that we're in, right? At one moment, what freedom might look like is an integrated classroom. At another moment, um, especially under the threat of very real violence, and I'll use the, the words of um, that same founder of Freedom Georgia, she said, we're looking for a safe space. And I don't think you can really argue with that. She's, she's, she's not arguing for... <laughs> um, segregation of the, of the nation overall. She's arguing for a safe space for a certain number of families that, that, um, that perceive themselves to need it, and I um, completely understand that. The professor knows this personally. She has people in her own family who started this black settlement in Oklahoma. Um, and then uh, <laughs> when that fell through um, and Oklahoma ended up looking a lot like Mississippi in terms of its Jim Crow laws, um, they were participating in a Back to Africa movement and they ended up um, helping to purchase a ship for $69,000 in 1913 and 14 and actually migrating to the Gold Coast, which is now present day Ghana. Welcome to present-day Ghana, where according to the International Monetary Fund, they've now produced one of the fastest growing economies and where the success and safety here rank alongside several countries in Europe. In the last few years, black Americans searching for a real-life Wakanda started moving here in droves. Hello, everybody. Rashad McCrory. I'm from Harlem, New York City. 40-year-old Rashad McCrory runs a travel company and moved here during the pandemic. He says he's here living his best life and is not looking back. It's all part of the systematic injustice that put us in a condition where a lot of times we have to come out of America to heal, to be places where we're not always the, the victims. We're not always in protection mode. And, and, and being in Africa right now and, and relocating out of the United States, whether it's temporary or long term, I feel myself healing. I, I'm starting to see black people who are loving unity. That's some strong stuff, right? That you had to leave America to heal. It's like now I'm on the outside looking in. You know, like 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 what they say about a bad relationship. You're you're in a bad relationship, but you don't know it because it's all you know. For the first time in his life, he says he's not afraid of the police. Only in Ghana, I have police friends. You know, in America, I refuse to have police friends, no matter what the ethnicity is. And, um, and it comes from the system. I'm starting to see that people can have altercations and it, and it doesn't have to turn into violence. That law enforcement isn't, is, isn't a villain. You know, it's, it's, so, it's so many things that I'm starting to see in a different in a different light that's actually making me more of a whole person, showing me what reality is and actually showing 
how at sometimes diabolical <laughs> systematic injustice is in America because it, it has us thinking all, all, all out of whack. <laughs> music, you know, when I'm listening to Ghanaian music, I don't hear I don't hear anything about fighting. I don't hear anything about shooting. I may hear ganja, you know, marijuana in, in, in some of the songs and, yeah, and yeah. alcohol. But when I listen to my American music, this shoot, shoot, drugs, drugs, murder, murder, you know, on everything, here, we're not hearing that on everything. It's a lot of things going on in America that's, that as Black Americans, we need to get away from from some time. You know, and, and hear what real, see what real healthy living is about. At the home site for Black families in Wilkinson County, Georgia, Dr. Tabitha Ball and her husband, Greg Mullins, say they first need to build roads, get running water and electricity here before families can build their homes. And even though they currently live in a community with black doctors and black police, they say that moving here is still better for their family. We're not preaching separation. We're not preaching segregation. No, we just want to be safe. That's it. Exactly. That's all. We're not asking for anything else. I just want to be just able to live. Safe. Is that just too <laughs> much just to ask for? Or just to be safe <laughs> and happy and healthy. That's what this is stemming from. Safety. That's what this is about. They feel that black Americans in today's world are suffering trauma and that the solution for them is to get away. This land to be an example and an inspiration to other families that you too can buy land together and create the village that you want for yourselves. And this is our village. We are a village of families and we happen to be black families, but what we want is for all families to have and experience that same power of doing something together and building something for ourselves. For ABC News Live, I'm Steve Osinsami. Our thanks to Steve for that piece. In the world of sports, 2020 started with heartbreak, with the loss of NBA giant Kobe Bryant and his daughter Gianna, along with nine others in that tragic helicopter accident. Then, as COVID began to spread across the globe, we saw the whole sports world come to a halt. And we also saw athletes at their most vulnerable and feeling empowered as they took a stand against racial injustice. Alex Prochet looks back at this year in sports. Twenty twenty began on the NFL's biggest stage, Super Bowl Fifty Four. Patrick Mahomes leading the Kansas City Chiefs to their first title in fifty years, and earning head coach Andy Reid a ring with a win over the San Francisco Forty Niners. But as one new star emerged, we lost another: basketball legend Kobe Bryant, his thirteen-year-old daughter Gianna, and seven others were killed in a helicopter crash in the hills above Calabasas, California all on their way to a youth basketball tournament. The outpouring of grief was widespread. The NBA paid tribute honoring Bryant on and off the court. Fans from all over the world mourning their idol, especially in Los Angeles. Kobe, a loving father of four girls who became an advocate for women's basketball. Then March brought a different kind of madness, the COVID-19 pandemic. The Utah Jazz's Rudy Gobert's positive test bringing games to a halt. The game tonight has been postponed. Setting off a chain reaction. The NBA suspending its season. The NCAA shocking basketball fans, no tournaments, no championships this year. The 2020 Olympics postponed. Thousands of top athletes sidelined. After months of no games, the NBA created a bubble to resume play safely at Disney World. Athletes used the time off to bring awareness to racial justice sparked by the police-involved killings of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor. We are dedicating this season to Breonna Taylor, an outstanding EMT who was murdered over 130 days ago in her home. The same energy that we had on the floor is the same energy that we have towards having justice for Breonna Taylor. Then, taking unprecedented action, interrupting play after another shooting of a black man by police. We keep loving this country, and this country does not love us back. And it's just, it's really so sad. The outrage over the police shooting of Jacob Blake spilling onto the courts and fields of American professional sports. The WNBA, Major League Baseball, and soccer all postponing their games in solidarity. We all have an opportunity to keep the focus on the issues and demand change. Back on the court. 
the Los Angeles Lakers defeated the Miami Heat in the NBA Finals behind the superstar duo of LeBron James and Anthony Davis, dedicating their win to Kobe Bryant. Despite some challenges in the condensed season, Major League Baseball successfully crowned the Los Angeles Dodgers World Series champions. Corey Seager's MVP performance helping end the team's 32-year drought, but the celebration controversial. Justin Turner joined the on-field celebration despite testing positive for being pulled from the game. 2020 wasn't perfect, but it had its moments of perfection. Sports continue to press forward, giving us something to root for and the hope that comes with heading into a new year. Alex Perche, ABC News, Washington. What a year. Well, after the break, despite all the loss, there were some bright spots in 2020. If you can't think of one or none come to mind, we've got you covered coming up. Powerful stories of our time, anytime. Nightline. Admit it, these days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America in the afternoon? GMA 3, what you need to know. Lunchtime at 1 Eastern, 12 Central and Pacific on ABC. It's all about you. Sex, gambling, fraud, betrayal, and murder. Cutthroat Inc., the podcast. The a family truth. on a mission to find their son. A year's worth of conversations with the killer. Cutthroat Inc., subscribe for free now on your favorite podcast app. What you're seeing right now, this is part of the eye wall. This procession of migrants goes back two miles. There is going to be catastrophic damage. This fire has made a run. You can see those flames shooting up into the sky. We are on the jam-packed red carpet. Let's do it right, guys. So this is the fourth weekend of protest. <laughs> Watch NBC News on location for Facebook Watch. Breaking news, context, analysis. With today's extraordinary news cycle. Now is the perfect time for ABC News Live. A streaming news game changer. The time is now for ABC News Live. Get it, streaming everywhere. The world may feel out of your control, but your happiness doesn't have to be. Learn the secrets to happiness. Listen to the 10% Happier podcast, free on Apple Podcasts. More Americans choose ABC News, America's number one news source. It has certainly been a year that we will never forget, but through it all, there have been moments that give us all hope, something to hold on to. Tonight, Michael Strahan takes a moment to help us remember those bright spots. I think it's important to share stories of positivity because it's those stories that help you find the silver linings in life. Nine-year-old Orion Jean won $500 in a speech contest. With the money, Orion purchased toys for a local children's hospital in August. When you think about it, donating toys to someone who really needs it, it's a reward in itself. Orion started a Race for Kindness campaign, donating meals to those who are food insecure. I have some exciting news. We have now officially reached our goal of 100,000 meals, plus some. I think these stories, these uplifting stories, just gave so much joy to everybody in this really, really difficult time. I'm all emotional because I just voted for the first time. Inez Zach, originally from Mexico City, shared her emotional journey to become an American citizen and gain her right to vote. I've been waiting for 46 years to actually do this when I was in my country of birth. The very first time that I could vote, they said, we don't have any more ballots. So I couldn't vote. Shortly after 1995, Inez came to the United States to pursue her dream to become a musician. Last year in November, I became a citizen finally. So I gained the right to vote and to exercise my voice. What time did Chris tell him? Good job. 
In early November, Chris Nickich made history as the first person with Down syndrome to complete the Ironman triathlon. Don't stop, keep going. And Chris continues to be an inspiration to us all. Posting on his Instagram, time to set a new and bigger goal for 2021. I'm grateful that I can do anything. Kindness is contagious. Lexi Burke is one of my favorite examples of that. Oh my gosh. Since May, Lexi has raised over $159,000 with donations from her TikTok followers. Together, they've been able to tip over 114 service industry workers affected by the lockdown. Oh my God, thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> is there a slide? We're gonna slide another thousand in there. Oh. <laughs> thank you, guys. Thank you. 2020 was the clear example that when things get hard, human beings really do step up for each other. We were chosen for 2020. We were trusted for 2020. We went through something together. And at times like this, it's important to remember that we are stronger when we work together. We went through it together. Before we go tonight, the image of the day, the final full moon of the year filled the night sky on Tuesday. Look at that. It's known as the cold moon, and you're looking at it rising above the snow-topped San Gabriel Mountains and the Los Angeles skyline. A beautiful shot there. And that is our show for this hour and for this year. 2020, the inaugural year of Prime. Stay, stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top, top, top stories. I'm Janae Norman, in for Lindsay Davis. Thank you so much for streaming with us. Have a good one.